So I was feeling nervous. Now I'm feeling more nervous. Oh. Um, as JD said, let me see if I can start this PowerPoint. It's kind of my timekeeper. If you don't know, um, nope, now it started out where I didn't want it to. Start here. OK, this is the flag of Morocco. And if you don't know, how many people know where Morocco is? Yes, where is it? Somebody. Yes, exactly. Only go forward a few thousand miles in the northwest coast of Africa, right across the Strait of Gibraltar from Spain. So Morocco is very close to Europe and ha maintains some pretty close ties. Morocco uh, is right next to Algeria and is broken into three uh, different areas, what we would call the north, which is the reef, the center, which is uh, the center or Amazir area, and the south, which is Shula area. These are areas def based upon a uh, language definition, a language spoken by the original inhabitants of Morocco. We would call the first uh, northern group uh, language Tarifit, the center group the Amazir speak Tamazir, and the southern group speak Tashilhit. All of them uh, are known as Imazirin, but really we use the term Berber because it's simpler and it encompasses everybody from the Canary Islands all the way to um, Egypt, Siwa Oasis. Uh, if you're an indigenous inhabitant of North Africa, then you would be known as Berber. Um, i am already lost my train of thought, so I'm going to refer to my notes. Hmm, okay. Morocco is a monarchy. And one of the problematic uh, issues that uh, Berbers have faced over time is that the state has defined itself as an Arab and Islamic state, and it doesn't define itself as an Arab Berber Islamic state. Arabs came to Morocco in the 600s with the Arab invasion spreading Islam. Now, for centuries, there was no conflict between whether you identified yourself as Arab or you identified yourself with Berber. Most people were identified by tribal and regional affiliations. And it's only over um, the period of a French protectorate in Morocco that started at the turn of the century, lasted up until independence in 1956. It's only with the French protectorate that there really get, began to be this divide between people who identified as Arab and people who identified as Berber. During the French protectorate, there was something called the Berber Dahir that I believe um, was instituted in 1930. And I quote uh, Kevin Dwyer, who says, a central tactic of French policy in Morocco during the protectorate was to emphasize distinctions between Arabs and Berbers, and through support given to Berber institutions, to encourage Berbers to become protégés of the French. This policy, known as la politique berbère, was consecrated by the Berber Dahir of 1930, which formalized differences between Berber and Arab customs, making them into distinctions in civil law. This policy, rather than driving a wedge between Arab and Berber, which was really the goal of the protectorate, brought them together in the struggle against the French for Moroccan independence. In fact, already in 1930, when the Moroccan independence movement first organized demonstrations, it included among its demands the repeal of the Berber Dahir. So the French wanted to create this kind of separation amongst the Berbers and the Arabs by having uh, completely different um, uh, ways of uh, ruling. So they let the Berbers utilize customary law, and they made the Arabs use civil law and uh, Sharia law. But they really wanted to create a divide using a divide and conquer tactic. What happened was that after independence, then there needed to be a nation state created, whereas before there hadn't really been a unified and homogenous nation state. There had been these little regional areas, tribal affiliations, and a lot of conflict over who might inherit the reins of um, government after independence movement. So 
the kind of intellectual elitists who were primarily located within the urban areas kind of claimed for themselves the greatest role in the independence struggle and claimed for themselves the um, <coughs> reins of power and uh, backed Mohammed V, who was uh, the ruler uh, who proclaimed himself or was proclaimed at the time of independence against these large numbers of populations in rural areas who had also fought in the independence movement but identified and preferred to have different kinds of leadership um, after independence. So there became this kind of Arab-Berber split. But in order for these, the self-identified Arabs to take over the control of the government and to kind of create this homogenous unity where there wasn't a unity before, they needed to have um, a, a self-definition of the state that um, precluded this possibility of there being strife, struggle, civil war, etc. So they declared the state Arab and Islamic and allied themselves more with um, a, their continued affiliation with France and with other Arab nations rather than supporting the Berber indigenous populations and their kind of self-identity. So what I want to talk about is how over time the state uh, repressed its Berber populations. It prohibited all kinds of communications in Berber languages and um, emphasized Arabic and French as national languages, against which a large percentage of the population was really left disenfranchised. And by disenfranchised, I mean that Berbers could not have school in their own language, they could not have any kind of publications, there could be no public speaking in their language, none of the laws uh, were in their language, no signs, no publications, I mean really nothing was allowed into the public sphere that was in Berber language. It had to be French or Arabic. On the other hand, we have at least 50 or 60 percent of the population that identifies itself as Berber and speaks Berber and doesn't necessarily speak Arabic or French. So that meant that we have 50 or 60 percent of the population at a particular period of time before the spread of education, et cetera, that um, really had no ability to interact with the state or with any of the state institutions because they couldn't utilize the same language and they always had to use an intermediary or a translator. That meant uh, in courts of law, that meant in anything that had to do with uh, government or kind of personal law, personal status, et cetera, there always was an intermediary. So we have this condition in which the, an era, a state that identifies itself as Arab, utilizing a policy of Arabization and Francophonization, then marginalizes or represses Berber language public expression. Of course, there were always uh, individuals who um, wanted there to be a recognition of Berbers as a strong cultural component of Morocco. And they formed organizations throughout the country. And those organizations were declared illegal and were often um, repressed whenever they had uh, libraries or offices or meeting places. The, they were raided by the police. People were arrested and imprisoned for 17 to 20 some odd years for kind of um, asking that there be kind of a, a new politique berbère which allowed Berbers public expression, allowed education in the language, allowed any kind of publications, et cetera. However, over time, and partly because um, Morocco had this close tie with uh, Europe and wanted to be part of the European Union, there were a lot of pressures from Europe that uh, Moroccan human rights abuses be minimized. So one of those minimizations came through uh, allowing um, Berbers to 
um, have political organizations, but also to have cultural organizations, to be able to um, publish and um, have kind of public sphere expressions in Berber language. So this only changed around the mid-90s that you began to have some journals, you began to have pages in the newspaper or sections that were in Berber language, and that um, these uh, people who had been producers of music videos of Berber culture and traditions began to start making films in Berber languages. And these are all the covers of the various uh, video or DVD boxes of films that they've produced. When um, I first started, my research was in the mid-90s when I went to Morocco to look at Moroccan cinema. And I was very uh, surprised because um, I had studied Morocco and I'd never learned anything about the Berbers. I'd never seen anything in the history books except it was like something that happened in 1700. There was a Berber dynasty. But, you know, it really seemed something archaic. And it was only when I went there that I began to meet people who were like, yes, I'm Berber. I'm like, oh, what does that mean? Oh, different. And recognized that it was, there was this whole movement in which there's a real specificity to Berbers in terms of not only where they live, but the way they dress. The language is slightly different, as I told you about the three different regions. Um, the kinds of uh, cultural manifestations that they do, the kinds of songs that they sing, et cetera, it's all very different. And it's very different from what you would find primarily in urban areas. It tends to be a rural phenomenon. And that I was introduced to these Berber videos. And well, I had been looking at cinema and seeing all of the films that were made by the Cinema Center uh, for development, and I had seen a lot of the feature films that had been made, and I recognized that there was this huge gulf. There was here a cinema and a construct of the nation as this kind of homogenous uh, Moroccan, Arabic, um, primarily urban uh, world, and then on the other hand, it totally elided or left out of the equation anything that had to do with the rural world or had to do with Berber speakers. None of the languages that were used in cinema uh, included Berber. Even if they were in the rural area, they would all somehow speak Arabic, Moroccan Arabic. And what's important about that is that before the kind of widespread of education, which is really emerging now, people who lived in rural areas uh, and self-identified as Berber didn't speak Moroccan Arabic. They didn't speak classical Arabic, which is the Arabic that you would use in newspapers and newscasts um, that would be used in law, etc. cetera, uh, as the language of the Quran. And they didn't speak uh, necessarily French and they didn't speak Moroccan Arabic, which is kind of a mix of Arabic and Berber. They spoke only Berber. So besides being um, separate culturally and linguistically, um, there was also the situation that on television and in film, they were not represented at all. They were just completely as though this whole 50%, 75% of the nation didn't exist. So some of the filmmakers that had started out producing music videos, because music is extremely important in Morocco, were influenced by these Berber cultural organizations to start making films, which are narrative feature films, but they're shot in video. And one of the reasons that they're shot in video is that the national cinema organization that uh, is kind of mandated by the king to create and foster this national, um, what do I call it, national kind of ideology of Arab Islamic Morocco, wouldn't give funding to films that were set and utilized um, Berber only language or included Berber language or included Berber culture. There was a lot of fear that kind of allowing the Berber culture 
to reemerge and to become strong would destabilize the state. If you know much about North Africa, there's a strong movement in Algeria uh, amongst Berbers that um, was seen to be threatening to the stability of the state, and Morocco really fe feared that kind of allowing the strong Berber movement would destabilize Morocco as it had Algeria. So there couldn't be feature films. Um, there weren't um, too many uh, public manifestations of Berber language. So this all changed in the mid-90s. The um, state gave permission for these filmmakers who started out with these cultural organizations to begin to make feature films in Berber language. And what was interesting is um, the while there were approximately, say, 50 films in uh, Moroccan Arabic or uh, traditional Arabic in the mid-90s that were you know, more recently modern, by that same time, after only a few years of production, there were at least 30 films in Berber language made on video. So within just a couple of years, there had been this huge pro prolific outpouring of films that are made in Berber, primarily set in rural areas, and um, targeting Berber speakers. I'm going to um, kind of go back to reading for a second. Um, it's one strategy used to preserve local and multi-vocal national heritage was local video productions. These are primarily made by the Berbers in the south of Morocco, Tashilhit speakers. They produced music videos and also narrative features. The filmmakers said that if filmmaking and celluloid would be prohibited to them, then they would use an even more effective medium, video, to challenge the national cinematic construct, uh, utilizing Berber language, Berber locations, Berber actors, and Berber stories. The films on video function diversely as entertainment, but also as political statements of Berber cultural specificity and Moroccan cultural and ethnic heterogeneity. The videos do not fill a void created by neglect, but by repression, which is, I think is very important, of cultural identity, which is quite different. Even though the state no longer repressed public demonstrations of Berber identity, Berbers still faced a form of cultural elitism that in essence forced them to utilize more marginalized media rather than cinema and filmmaking. The state would not fund nor give permits to film or television in Berber language, but would permit the video. Why do you think that video would be allowed whereas cinema and other production wouldn't be? What do you know about video? I suddenly revert to the Professor Lee role. Anybody? Yes. And you said that they didn't gain funding from right. Africa, the, war. the um, state. Obviously, the video would be a lot cheaper to produce. Right. The market. Right. So videos were a lot cheaper to produce. They could move very quickly because you didn't need a huge crew to shoot video. But also, they were cheaper to market. And here we have an environment in which 50% of the population lives in urban areas, 50% of the population lives in rural areas. And I don't know if you can tell from just looking at the photos on the covers, but by rural areas, we're talking no electricity, no running water, no roads. I mean, very rural. At the same time, it would be very rural. There were lots of satellite dishes, lots of VCRs and televisions that you could run off of car batteries. So there was a lot of access to media um, if there was media content. You have national television and radio primarily that are in a language you can't understand, showing images that don't represent you unless it's through folklore of some kind. And then along come these individuals who are making not only images of uh, where you live and what you look like and what your neighbors are, but using a language that you can understand and making it accessible. The videos could, could easily be marketed, reproduced. 
In fact, what's interesting is the video makers themselves didn't really care that videos were pirated. As long as the word got out, as long as the videos circulated, they were happy because it didn't take a whole lot of video sales for them to make profits. These weren't high budget productions. So they could make their videos, sell some copies, and yet find there be a wide distribution of kind of copying or sharing or trading off of the videos and there would be wide circulation and that was important to them more than sales was the actual dissemination of the message. While each year fewer and fewer film theaters operate in Morocco with almost no screens in rural areas and more homes hooked up to satellite dishes VCRs Video production is more sensible than film production, even if it doesn't have the same elitist value. Um, so I would say that right now I've collected about 65 films and out of approximately 15 production companies. So I've been collecting the films since 1995-96, in which I started off with about 20 or 30 that I could find, and there were about five production companies. Now I've collected 65. There are about 15 production companies. And I am thinking there are about 30 films and probably a few production companies out there operating that I don't really know about. Sometimes a company may make one film, um, sometimes they may make uh, a whole series of them, like the biggest producer has probably made 15 or 20 films. Some, uh, one of their tactics, which I thought was quite ingenious, was to jump on the popularity of soap operas and start making films with sequels. So that you would watch a film and it would be very interesting and the story would begin to develop and then it would stop and then you'd have to go out and get the next one to see what happened next. Um, so I've obviously been speaking longer than my slideshow. Sorry about that. Um, so let me get to my conclusion about the videos. Um, they are fictions rather than ethnographies. And these fictions have several characteristics. They are not top-down productions because they are not generated by the state and handed down to the people the state wants to influence. They are not pro-social and do not advocate any traditional type of development and are more oriented to maintaining and expressing culture than promoting any changes. They're very much made for promoting culture and for entertainment. Um, if there is a form of development message, it would be the promotion of Berber language, the promotion of women's self-expression and self-reliance, the promotion of traditional images and stories. There are several genres, including drama, melodrama, filmed theater, autobiography, horror, which is comic, and comedy. A particularly attractive aspect of the Berber videos is that multiple identities are reflected. On one hand, the rural native tricksters, storytellers, and even gangsters find place next to successful urban musicians, singers, and businessmen. Most often stories revolve around family and village strife, greed and its disastrous results, generational conflicts, gender tensions, and generally the difficulties of having a successful life um, given uh, a lot of problems. Most often the story settings are authentic locales, such as we go to someone's house, thank you, C. Mohammed, for letting us film in your house and in your fields and in your village. Um, they vary between urban and village settings, but most often they're rural stories with rural problems and rural representations. The video makers rely upon relatively well-tried story conventions and plots, which are known to be appreciated by Berber consumers who like to see real people and real locales that remind them of their own families, histories, and origins. So we have two different consumers of Berber videos. Some would be uh, urban residents, all who have family from rural areas, and oftentimes there's a lot of visiting between urban and rural environments. 
but um, that is never represented audiovisually outside of these Berber films. Um, then you have rural residents who then get to see themselves represented on the screen. The Berber video makers remain extremely close to rural as well as urban traditions. People of all ages, locations, economic levels, and facing various sociocultural as well as personal issues. This knowledge then finds expression in their videos, yet with the recognition by the viewers that the videos are fictional. Some of the videos, most of them, are of very high quality, but some of them uh, really seem to be by early filmmakers who are still mastering the trade. Yet, um, it doesn't necessarily seem to be the quality that determines popularity. Um, some of the videos employ only regional actors or non-actors. Some of them employ um, actors who come from the stage, because there is actual a theater tradition uh, in Berber. Um, as yet, I would say there's no dominant style or trend in terms of aesthetic characteristics, acting, narrative line, or directorial style, except for a few things which um, I wasn't able to really represent in the video that I'm going to show you um, that has some clips from some videos. But they tend to be um, very focused on rural scenery. It's not uncommon for there to be story and then pan over the rural environment and the donkey walking along. And then, okay, back to the story. Um, there's usually a lot of traditional music involved, and I think that part of that comes from some of the filmmakers coming out of the tradition of making music videos, so they have handy people right there. Lots of rituals, such as weddings, circumcisions, and other kinds of big events are often represented, and there's ever-present tea making and drinking. Anybody who's ever been to Morocco, you would know that tea making and drinking is a very big part of socializing. So in every video, there are umpteen scenes of people making tea and having tea. So you can't barely watch one with like, I need tea. The videos focus primarily on rural areas that are never included in films made by urban Moroccans. And even if it talks about um, Berbers migrated to urban areas, they're never uh, talked about in national media, only in Berber films. Um, in the same way that wedding videos might circulate from house to house and are viewed over and over again. Oh, in case you didn't see it the first time. And they serve as a source of education as well as entertainment. I don't know if you've ever had that phenomenon, but which, in which videos that are made over important events like birthday parties and weddings get circulated, looked at, you re rehearse everybody that you know, etc. The Berber language videos serve a special function. They spark memories and recognition, serve as tools for the knowledgeable to instruct the neophyte, they invigorate language and storytelling, and they connect individuals, individuals to their wider community. Importantly, the videos indicate that Berber culture groups are not yet willing to have their identity subsumed into a wider homogenous Moroccan Arabic identity fostered by the state. Berber media also extends internationally to recuperate immigrant populations. All of the video producers not only have offices in Morocco, but they have distribution offices in Europe, particularly France and Belgium. Uh, interviews within Morocco reflect that immigrants utilize the mass-produced videos in similar fashion to home movies made while on summer visits back home. The videos allow them to immerse themselves in language, images, and scenarios that are familiar, comforting, and nostalgia-producing. Whereas nostalgia was once satisfied or intensified um, by material objects from home, things that you buy when you're out um, trying to recall uh, things specifically Morocco, with audiovisual media, nostalgia takes on a whole new dimension because the object reproduces language, relationships, scenarios, and environments. So formally left to the individual imagination and memory. Um, I talked about the fact that um, you don't need to sell a lot of video cassettes for them to make money back for the producer. 
A video might sell for approximately $10, and again, these are two-hour films. Uh, with the introduction of the VCD, which is a form of a DVD, but a lot cheaper because you can burn onto CD, the films cost approximately $1.30. And that's if you buy an original in the package um, document rather than a pirated one, which sells for even cheaper. <coughs> They sell them in shops that particularly sell videos, but they also sell them uh, in a number of other different avenues. Uh, maybe the Berber storekeeper on the corner has some videos that he sells or rents. They have video rental stores or little shops that would have them available. And then they have numerous fellows um, on every other street corner selling pirated copies and of Hollywood films, but also they're going to include uh, Berber films. Once sold, the videos circulate freely among friends and families. Most advertising has been limited to word of mouth, the traditional method of communication in Morocco, the grapevine, and the most effective. Since illiteracy is still extremely high and many consumers know content, but not the names of the videos they've seen, um, the colorful packaging, which you've seen, is designed to be visually descriptive of the actors and the scenes that will distinguish between the different videos. Packaging and posters tend to be primarily in Berber and uh, Arabic script of Berber, although French is used by some companies um, because particularly they're being marketed abroad and um, youth may not read Arabic uh, and particularly don't read Berber. Most often they are not subtitled, but if they are, the subtitling is in French, uh, again, because of a lot of the uh, European consumers. Um, one thing that's really changed is as we've kind of moved in this trajectory from um, this outright banning of any kind of expression in Berber to allowing these Berber video productions to proliferate and to disseminate. And they've proved to be so popular that as of the year 2000, the state allowed there to be a national festival of Amazir film or national festival of Berber film. And I think it's interesting that they call it Berber film, even though they're made on video, they still want to kind of recuperate them into this fold of you know, this value that film holds that um, video doesn't seem to. Um, when they had that national festival, it was covered widely in the press, and a lot of the people I knew who had never even heard about Berber videos before were suddenly interested, and it kind of really boosted production. So that's why over the last 12 years, there are at least 65 to 95 films that have been produced. Uh, which is about 10 times the number of films in celluloid that have been produced. And they're much more uh, available than films uh, made by the state. So, in conclusion, um, Berber videos are a form of resistance to sociopolitical silencing of Berber cultural discourse at the national level. They are profitable process of cultural discourse and they have utilitarian ends. People get to see themselves rendered on the screen, they get to have entertainment, and the video makers themselves um, have made quite a lot of money uh, from this field even though a lot of the films are pirated. And to give you um, a general idea of what they look like, I made a little 15-minute clip of the films that I collected um, just uh, two years ago when I was last there. And play.